Good. Um, then just a second. Um, I would ask you also uh, to mute the, 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 the microphone uh, while not, uh, not speaking. Um, and I come to some of the, uh, of the techni technicalities uh, also later on uh, in, the, uh, in the session. So welcome uh, to the eShape uh, webinar uh, on tools um, to add site and platform managers uh, in assessing site status and existing remote sensing uh, data products. My name is uh, Johannes Peterseil. I'm from the Environment Agency Austria, and I will guide you through the today's uh, webinar, which hopefully is uh, quite interesting for you. Uh, and we, on, we also try not only to, uh, to give some presentations, but also uh, to have an, an, an interactive part uh, in discussion uh, at the end. Uh, the webinar is an activity of the eShape project aiming to enhance the user uptake of Copernicus and Earth observation data products, as well as to foster the implementation of EuroGeos. And this is uh, the frame uh, what we are working uh, in and uh, with these pilots and the tools we developed uh, trying to contribute uh, to this task. eShape is a European funded project under the Horizon 2020 program uh, and it is now in its final phase uh, and also in this uh, dissemination activities, uh, reaching out uh, to stakeholders uh, and potential users. The work and tools uh, presented in the webinar are the results uh, of the My Ecosystem activities uh, within the, the project, aiming to better link uh, in situ and Earth observation data uh, and provide some tools uh, to ease uh, this work uh, in the also in the daily work uh, and to enhance visibility uh, of data of sites uh, and uh, to, to support uh, the work uh, you were doing. So um, the availability on information on the environment uh, and its effects uh, of global change on ecosystems, the processes, functions uh, and, uh, and ecosystem services uh, is, is a key prerequisite for any targeted uh, decision on different scale. Um, IPBES, so this intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, uh, is one of them, uh, for example, addressing the assessment of biodiversity uh, and uh, ecosystem services, and they have a quite high demand uh, on information uh, and data gathered at uh, a range of sites. But still a lot of knowledge gaps uh, exist, which range from information gaps where no monitoring uh, is done in, the, in an appropriate way, but also in terms of data availability. Uh, and this later one uh, is an aspect we are trying to address uh, with, the, with the tools uh, we are doing. So in the frame of the eShape project, my, the My Ecosystem Showcase um, and uh, the Elta Networks, uh, try to address uh, these issues uh, by demonstrating the mobilization and valorization of long-term ecosystem and biodiversity in situ data, uh, including harmonization uh, and to, to enhance the, the accessibility and availability uh, of the data to a wider uh, range of uh, stakeholders and users, and to provide access to spatial, continuous, uh, and value-added uh, Earth observation products. So to linking uh, exactly this gap uh, between the two, but also take a, a further step and provide uh, access to modeled uh, derived data, such the essential biodiversity variables, uh, which are completing this link from in situ data to Earth observation uh, to uh, the uh, to indicators uh, which can be used for decision support and the policy uh, and the science policy interface. The major aim was to, to have a, a one-stop shop, so where we try to integrate uh, this information. And these are also the tools we are going to present you uh, in the next uh, hour. So what we, are, uh, what we are trying to do is to reach uh, a number of different stakeholders, uh, which we see uh, as important uh, users. And this range from the uh, site and platform coordinators or protected area managers gathering the data, sharing, but also use that for their daily uh, decision to the research community, which is an important player in the generation of information and knowledge 
to environmental assessment, assessment agencies taking up this information for their decision uh, and <clears throat> feeding into uh, the science policy uh, interface. Within the MIEC system <clears throat> uh, showcase, we implemented uh, three pilots um, exactly to bridge uh, this gap between in situ data provision and the provision of uh, indicators like the essential biodiversity variables. And this we will uh, go to present you uh, in, the, in the next hour, um, ranging from my site, uh, which is addressing the in situ component, my space, uh, which is targeting to the uh, space component and earth observation to my variable, uh, trying to provide aggregated uh, indicators uh, for a variety of views. So these different pilots uh, doesn't stand uh, alone or a standalone products, but link are linked <clears throat> with information flows to enhance uh, the value uh, for the for the end users. Uh, and in the in the next hours, we exactly want to go through that uh, and try to uh, bring you <clears throat> uh, try to show you uh, the different tools, which hopefully are uh, important for your daily work. So <clears throat> the agenda uh, really will be uh, as the following. So starting from the in situ component uh, with focusing on DIMES SDR, a major tool uh, which is used in the, in the ELTA context, um, <clears throat> uh, providing information on long-term uh, observation facilities and data, linking to the, to the space component, uh, having added value uh, data for targeted uh, area, uh, to EBVs, and finally uh, coming to the visualization and integration of all this data into the EcoSense uh, platform. This we want to do uh, in a series uh, of present short presentations, uh, which will provide uh, some input. Um, there will be a question and answer session uh, at the end, where we try to address all the different uh, questions coming to you. Uh, and after three presentations, we also make a, a short break uh, for health reasons. Um, only some uh, techni uh, techni technicalities. Um, please mute your microphone during the, the, the presentations. Use raised hand uh, for direct interaction uh, when it's needed. Uh, during the presentation, please collect your uh, questions uh, and comments uh, and provide them uh, through the chat box, and we will address them in the final uh, discussion and question and answer session. So we really can go uh, through these uh, different uh, activities. By this, uh, I want to uh, hand over to the, to the presenters, uh, guiding you through the, the work done and uh, showcasing uh, the tools uh, we are providing. Uh, and I hope uh, you have a, uh, a nice uh, and informative uh, hour in the, uh, in the afternoon. So with this, I stop uh, and I hand over uh, to Christian, uh, to Christoph Wohner, um, presenting uh, the tools uh, on the in situ compon component. Hello, everyone. Just give me a second until I share my screen. Can you see a PowerPoint presentation? No, yes. it's not in presenting mode. No, it's the, it's still the... Okay, no, that, that was the question, if you can see like PowerPoint, so... Now it's okay. Okay, great. So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Christoph Wohner. I work for the Environment Agency Austria. I had a look at the participants list. Some of you already know me. For everyone that doesn't know me, it's very nice to meet you. I am working in the same department as Johannes does at the agency. And I'm also affiliated with the University of Salzburg and I'm a member of the EJ project and the ELTA project. And the ELTA community as such. So I'm going to talk to you about a wonderful service called DIMES CR, um, which is an online service um, that acts as a site and data set registry. Um, DIMES is, is available to everyone. I've put the URL in here in case you don't know it, you can, you can visit the website um, even during my presentation if you feel like it. Um, what is DIMES? DIMES allows to document environmental research and monitoring sites. Um, this little map here shows all the sites that we have registered on DIMES. So as you can see, uh, every single dot represents one site. So we have lots of sites, more than 1,200 to, to be precise. Um, for each of those sites, we feature a variety of information. 
So I've included one Austrian site that I like a lot because it's maintained by my agency. Um, and DIMES is a system that's used in a number of European Union projects such as eShape, but also in ELTA and its global umbrella network, ELTA. Um, what, is it does, what, what is it that DIMES does exactly? Um, we issue persistent identifiers for sites. Um, we provide information about observed properties, geographic information, contact details, environmental characteristics, images, um, project-related information, um, and so on and so forth. So I've taken a screenshot again of, of my beloved Austrian site on the right-hand side. Um, so if you fill in all the information, all the forms that we have on DIMES uh, diligently, then, then your site record might look something like this. And it doesn't just look nicely, um, but we also share all of that information we have on DIMES uh, through machine-readable endpoints. So everything that you see on DIMES when you, when you browse it and when you have a look at those records, that's also available in a format so that you can import it in scripts and um, GIS um, software and, and pretty much everything that, that you can use to, to process data. DIMES data can and has been used for a number of studies. So I've included some recent publications just to illustrate that DIMES is actually a very um, um, mature service and that it that it is out there and that DIMES itself is being used and the data on DIMES being used. And it has been used for a long time and hopefully will be continued to be used um, in the future. So one thing, since a lot of you are actually site and platform coordinators, I thought I'd use this chance to, to um, point out a very particular subservice of DIMES to ensure that your data is actually uh, correct and it's, it's fully filled in. And that is that we actually have a quality assurance tool. Um, so I often get asked, how can I see if, if my information is correct? Is how, how can I see that, that I filled in the forms properly? And for this, like for this particular question, I, I programmed a tool that does nothing but tell you if, if you filled in your site record nicely. It's also available online. So there's this uh, URL right here. It's QA, it's qualityassurance.dimes.org. You can just go there and type in your site name. You can type in any site name actually, and it will provide a quality uh, assurance report like the one you can see on the right-hand side. Um, it's visually, I think, very easy to comprehend. If it's green, it's good. If it's yellow, there might be an issue. And if it's red, which is not given in the example, then something's wrong. And the tool will hopefully always tell you what the problem is, so it's easy to know, and then you can fix it. Um, once you have provided your information, um, it is being shared to the public. And we have a number of, of services that do that, that allow to share that. Um, in particular, we have a lot of geodata services. So we have, for the people um, in the audience that are the more uh, on the technical side of things, we have WFS and WMS services. So that's serving geodata um, for every site. So that includes also things like the remote sensing analysis areas that we developed specifically for the eShape project. Um, you can export this um, information in a variety of GIS formats like shapefile, TML, GML, GeoJSON, and so on. So almost every data format that's common in the geodata um, domain um, can be exported in DIMES, and that can be used as input data for Python scripts, R scripts, or desktop GIS uh, software. Um, and if you open up our sitemap, um, it looks like this. So you, as you can see here, there's actually a number of different geographic layers for single sites. Again, if, if site managers choose to provide that information. So you have things like the hydrological catchment area or this E-shape remote sensing analysis area or other types of locations um, that can be added to a site and then can be shared with other people. Um, we have something that's even a little more on the technical side. So this is probably more something for web developers or people that have a stronger background in coding. We have something that's called the REST API, it's a very long and difficult acronym. Um, this REST API serves all the information that we have on DIMES as a machine readable, machine readable format. So like I said, when you look at the site and you have this nicely formatted page, everything that's on that page is also available for this 
um, API and the, the URL is given here. Oops, um, it's given here. Uh, very simple, it's times.org slash API. Um, it's following the op open API specification, um, more of the tech people in the audience. Um, that means it's, it's standardized. It's also very easy to, to read. Um, if you have the background, if you have the software for that, it serves not just the information about the sites, but for every entity on Dimes. Um, it can be used for scripts. Um, feel free to just plug in and work with that data. And if you want to have more information about how you can actually take information from Dimes, we also have real documentation that's that's less tech savvy than, than the screenshot I've uh, included here. Um, this page that's given here um, will just tell you the different ways how you can access data on Dimes and, and how you can query it and how you can work with that. In case it shouldn't be um, sufficient, uh, in case it's incomplete or you want to know more, you can just um, provide that feedback in the session um, and then I'll just, ex um, I'll just um, expand the documentation. We also have a very new addition to all of those data export functionality. Um, and that is that we have developed a Python package. It's called DimesPy. Um, this Python package just makes it easier to get data from Dimes. So when I talked about the REST API, I said, well, you know, this is for the tech savvy people and it's probably more for web developers. Um, and at some point we realized that we, we were serving data primarily for tech people, but not so much for the scientists that maybe can code, but they're more familiar with Python or R, but not with, with the, you know, with the, the, I wouldn't say proper, but uh, the maybe more challenging or more difficult ways to get and work with data. So we developed a Python package called DimesPy. Um, it's available as an official Python package on pypy.org. And um, it's, it basically has um, simple functionality to get site information out of Dimes. So you can um, normalize site, site identifiers, you can get lists of sites based on network affiliation, uh, if they're part of RIs based on spatial proximities, you can get site details. Um, so I've included an, an example here. So you can find sites that are close to input coordinates. So you can just write very, very little code and then you can get already an, a result. So, so you just import the package then we have a function it's called get sites within radius. And then you define a search radius and it will actually give you a list of results with the IDs of sites and the distance um, to the input coordinates. And then you have another function, it's called get, get site by ID. You enter the ID of a site and then you get the information about a site. Um, it's work in progress, it's very recent. As you can see, the last release was in May, at the beginning of May, so it was a month ago. Um, if you want more functions in there, you can just tell us. And, and if it's doable, if it makes sense, we will just extend the, pack, the Python package and release a new version. Um, I've included an example how you can use that. Um, it's very simple. Um, I was asked a few weeks ago by my esteemed superior to find out if Fluxnet sites were on dimes or if Fluxnet sites on dimes were close to, not the other way around, if Fluxnet sites were close to sites that were registered on dimes already. So I got a, a CSV, an Excel spreadsheet actually, that I transformed with 62 Fluxnet sites um, that had coordinates in there. And it was very simple. It, it was just asked to find out if there were sites close to those input sites. Um, so I wrote um, a little script for that. I used the Python package. Um, I had to write 30 lines of code, which took me about 30 minutes for the first working, working version. And then I was done. And the output was just that, that the script would return, for each coordinate, they would return three sites that were close, the three closest sites to the input coordinate. And that, that was it. It was just 30 minutes of work for something that if I had done it in QGIS, it would have probably taken me an afternoon. Or if it, if I had done that manually, it would have taken me two or three hours. But using the Python package, it was just 30 minutes. And not only was it fast, but it was also reproducible. So with QGIS, sometimes you, know, you have to just repeat the steps over and over again. So if you do an analysis and someone says, well, that was good, but I want something changed, then you have to do it again 
just click on other things. But if you write the script like this, you can just keep it, keep on running it again and again and again. And also if I change the input and say, I don't want to match Fluxnet sites, but I want to match ICO sites or ICB forest plots or, you know, whatever kind of input coordinates, you can just replace the input file and it will always just give it this output. This is what it would look like uh, if you if you print it, if you plot it on a map. So you have input coordinates. This is very, I, can, I don't know if you can see it, but it's very little cross here. Um, and then it would return the three sites sometimes that were closest. In this case, it was a very, very simple match because one site on register sometimes was six meters away from the input coordinates and the other two closest matches were 40 kilometers away and 50 kilometers away. Um, Maybe to give you another example, what you can also do is that you maybe you want to find out if, so imagine you're a scientist and you want to do a research project and you have a number of um, coordinates in particular ecosystems in Europe and you want to find out if within those ecosystems there are in principle research sites that you could co uh, contact for a research project. So we just take the coordinates, input them, and you'd get, you know, I don't know, some matches or maybe non-matches or lots of matches um, that might be suitable for your research. Um, one of very, very boring slide that I feel like I should include is the data license. So like I said, the uh, data on times is open. You can use it. Uh, it's it's uh, described in great detail uh, you, uh, here on under this URL. Um, how it is licensed and how you can use it. In principle, it's open. Uh, it's licensed under CC BY NC 4.0. That means you can take the information, you can work with it, you can also share it. Um, you can adapt it, you can change it, you can modify it. Um, the only thing that you have to do is that you cite it and you can't sell it. So if you do it for scientific purposes, um, some study, um, and you uh, publish a paper using time data, you can't just do it. It's very simple. Just take the data, work with it. You can use the APIs. You can use the Python package. Then add your own things on top and publish a paper. And all you hopefully do is just to cite the service and say that you got the data from times. That's all you need to do. If you do all of that, the result might be something like this little service that a colleague or a, a couple of colleagues of mine have developed in the eShape project. Uh, it's a service with the really cool title Crocodile. Um, it is a service that takes information from Dimes and it will return the most relevant tile um, for Sentinel Earth observation data. So if you have a, an Elta site somewhere, this service will automatically tell you the tiles that are relevant for that site. So that can be a part of like automatic data extraction processes. Uh, it was developed in the scope of this eShape project by um, those lovely colleagues. Um, and like I said, it utilizes um, Dimes data for its work. So if you have any questions now, and I can see there are lots of messages in the chat, um, I'll be happy to address all of them, but not right now, but at the end of this webinar. All right. Okay, <clears throat> many thanks, Christoph. Um, so that was the uh, was the part uh, on the uh, on the in situ data, and as uh, Christoph said, uh, we will uh, address the we collect the the, the, the questions uh, and address them uh, directly in the question and answer session. And I would like uh, to hand over uh, to Maria um, dealing with the uh, with the space component uh, and the and the generation of uh, Earth observation data products for Elto sites. Can you see my screen? Maria. Can you see yes, my screen? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. Good That's afternoon. Fine. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maria Patrizia Damo from uh, the National Research Council of Italy. And uh, my presentation is about the space component of uh, the My Ecosystem uh, Showcase. So the work uh, conducted by uh, within my space pilot uh, by myself and my and my space partners 
Uh, my experience objective uh, is to provide access to spatially continuous and uh, value-added EO product relevant to end users uh, by sharing workflows and uh, ready-to-use algorithms uh, by means of the virtual laboratory and by, sh uh, by sharing the EO-based product within uh, the EcoSense portal. Uh, the virtual laboratory is a tool for uh, facilitating the publication and uh, the invocation of a uh, work scientific workflow uh, in order to support uh, evidence-based decision making. And uh, the virtual laboratory allows connecting earth observation data and product with knowledge from experts uh, from ecological and socioeconomic fields to be used by end users such as scientists or decision makers. And um, the B-Lab makes data and model interoperable uh, through data brokering and uh, providing te technology technologies for containerization of software. And um, the B-Lab uh, version using eShape uh, is the one developed under uh, a legacy of joint projects such as the Potential and the Planet. Um, and also, uh, Durem eShape has been successfully tested uh, to run on Dias platform, such as Soblo, Honda, and Creodias, uh, in order to facilitate the access to Copernicus data. This is the, the web page of uh, the virtual laboratory. Uh, you can find in the, in the web page uh, all the documentation about the lab. Uh, the possibility to share your work workflow, your algorithm, your model uh, by using GitHub and uh, Docker Hub, and also uh, to run an experiment uh, by using one of the workflows already available in the virtual laboratory. laboratory. If you click on workflow, uh, to have the possibility to choose one of the workflows uh, available, and uh, also you can uh, you can select the workflow uh, by using some keyword here uh, for the searching and uh, uh, if you identify your workflow you can uh, uh, click on details and uh, uh, you can find the, the, uh, the information related to the workflow you choose in terms of input and output of the workflow and uh, the developer, the organization that de developed the, the workflow. And also, uh, you can create your uh, new experiment by uh, reporting the experiment name, the experiment de description, and the link to uh, the, uh, the input layer needed for, uh, for running the workflow. At the end of the execution, you can uh, find uh, your output and download it in, 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 in format uh, in JOT for uh, other kind of raster format. One of the, um, one of the um, workflow implemented during uh, each project is uh, the one for land cover uh, changes, for the, um, the identification of land cover changes. Uh, the algorithm implemented is the cross correlation analysis. It starts from a, a layer related to a land cover uh, target at the time T1. In this case, uh, I have shown the grassland layer for the Grand Paradiso National Park site. And uh, uh, this uh, layer is compared to uh, a Sentinel 2 image acquired in, the time, in a time T2. And uh, as output, uh, um, the workflow gives uh, um, the map of changes in the, in the target uh, length over uh, class uh, selected, in this case, grassland. Another, another uh, workflow uh, implemented, developed and implemented in, during the shape uh, is the snow cover extent workflow. It is based on, uh, on the use of, um, it, is ba it uses uh, um, information coming from the digital elevation model and uh, by using a Sentinel-2 uh, atmospherically correct and Sentinel-2 image um, to obtain, uh, obtain a map with snow and cloud uh, mask. Um, the workflow needs 
uh, a crowd mask as input uh, which can be obtained with the DF mask algorithm already uh, developed and ported in the lab and also uh, in the lab uh, sent to core for the atmospherical correction of a sentinel 2 image is, uh, is uh, implemented. Given snow cover maps, uh, we can also extract the snow cover duration uh, in terms of how many days uh, there are uh, snow, sorry, snow in, uh, in uh, every point. And uh, it is generated from a series of snow cover maps um, extracted by uh, the previous module. And each snow cover duration starts from the 1st September to, to, of each year uh, and ends on 31st August of the next year. A random forest uh, algorithm is used to fill the gaps in Sentinel 2 time series. And uh, also the DTM and the um, MODIS uh, snow cover product are used as additional uh, inputs. Another workflow uh, available in the lab is the water extent and hydro period. Uh, it consists in uh, two modules, two sub modules. The first one is the water mask module. It, it is used to separate an area into two classes, water and no water. This is an example for Doniana National Park in Spain. And uh, at the end, uh, at the end of the um, of this module, uh, there is the other model uh, which is able to extract annual hydro period, and um, by using the generated series of water masks mask obtained by the previous model. Uh, also, in this case, the hydro period starts from the first September each, each year and ends on the thirty first August of the next year. And uh, the gap filling is obtained by using uh, uh, different uh, interpolation approaches. Uh, the output is uh, a map, and uh, the gray value of each pixel in the map, in the map represents how many days uh, uh, there was water in every point. This module is, has been provided by SERP. Uh, another essential variable that can be extracted uh, by using workflows uh, implemented and available in the virtual laboratory is uh, the phenology. Uh, in particular, this is the, the module um, developed by CNR, the PVSIL. Uh, it starts from a sparse and even vegetation index time series uh, uh, and uh, is able to obtain a regular time series uh, and also um, some additional uh, logical metrics, uh, such as early day of maximum, mean, and variance statistics, uh, and uh, multi-year standard deviation. Um, it exploits uh, uh, a Bayesian harmonic model, and uh, it is implemented in Python. But uh, there are um, several other workflows implemented by MySpace partners uh, to obtain uh, phenology and uh, changes in phenology. In particular, uh, um, you can find in the virtual lab uh, the implementation of BFAST uh, by CERT uh, for the detection of changes in, uh, in NDVI time series. Uh, the implementation of uh, Phoenix for uh, to extract the phenology metrics, also uh, uh, developed by CERT, and uh, uh, the workflow uh, developed by CREAF for uh, uh, the extraction of uh, uh, phenological metrics uh, such as uh, dormancy, green up, maturity, and senescence. Um, my colleague already talked about Crocodile, uh, which has been uh, developed by my space partners, and I can go on. And uh, all the product will be available in the EcoSense portal. This is an example of a period for Kerkini uh, sites for uh, the available the, the year from 2015 to 2021. Uh, uh, when uh, Sentinel-2 uh, are available. Uh, so you can also uh, download the, the product obtained by using the workflow implemented in the lab, or uh, an alternative, uh, you can uh, run the, the workflow in the lab in, uh, in, uh, on your data. 
Um, I finished my presentation and thanks for your attention. I ask your question, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, uh, for the for the presentation. Uh, linking from the <clears throat> from the, the sites uh, to the to the space, uh, so providing you know uh, edit uh, or additional data for the for the single sites uh, which could be used. Uh, and uh, I would now like to hand over to Miguel, uh, talking about the essential biodiversity variables uh, addressing uh, the indicator level um, of the of the work uh, we were doing. Miguel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, yes. Yes. Excellent. Perfect. So everybody, hello. Thank you so much for um, willing to humor me. And um, um, I'm the third of the, uh, this uh, set of presentations. And I will be talking about um, uh, what we've been doing to, 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 to integrate um, biodiversity related information into a, a portal, which is what we call the essential biodiversity data portal. So obviously it's important to highlight the team that um, works with, with me and, and, um, and we, we, this is a joint effort among these people. Nestor, which is one of the lead persons in the project. Christian, he's the, the developer behind the portal that is, um, currently is struggling because the portal is broken and he's trying to <laughs> fix it. Luis, um, she's a master's student. She has been working developing the um, scripts and the R package that um, is behind the integration of this remote um, um, grid type data into, into NetCDF. Jose, it's a colleague from the US, works um, a lot in ecology but he brings a very interesting perspective and a little bit of fresh air into the thinking that we have with Enrique, which is the, uh, the, the, the main head in the, in the lab. So, okay. We, we all know that we have a problem and um, I, I wanted to start with this because it's important to, to understand why are we doing this? We have a problem and the problem is not super far away in some alien planet. We have the problem here and the problem uh, we have might, might cause um, the extinction of our species. This, these are the different aspects of the problem, right? You, you all are familiar with the biodiversity global change. These are the dimensions over exploitation, climate change, invasive species, pollution, habitat. The, the, we know that these are the issues. The, however, we don't know how these things interact and we don't know what is the real scope of each of these uh, dimensions. Um, there is this recent report produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the IPBES, that mentioned as one of the headlines that there is one million species at risk of extinction if we don't do anything, we will lose these species. However, there is an interesting discussion going on in the literature and uh, for us scientists that we follow this closely. It's a little bit of a surprise because there is a still, um, <laughs> there is a still uh, not clarity in terms of biodiversity loss. We really don't know what's going on. And I'm not saying that there is no, I'm not saying that there is no biodiversity crisis. What I'm saying is that we don't have the information that can back up our statements. And that's a problem. This is, this is more or less the data that we have. And these are two interesting examples that I would like to bring your attention to. The first one is the GBIF, right? This is one of the most important integrate, uh, in, integrative efforts for biodiversity information that has started putting together information from collections from biodiversity uh, collections, voucher specimens from museums and herbariums that were brought together initially. And now it only, it also includes in, um, uh, uh, so diverse data sources like citizen science, for instance. And the bottom one is one of the most important archives of remote sensing information. You are experts, you know this. This is the land site, and this is an analysis, a quick and dirty analysis I did about density. You can clearly see the patterns, the global patterns. 
um, um, here, and obviously poli political, <laughs> political interests here of, of, on where exactly most of the information comes from. But the, the, the thing that I want to say from here is that having the information is not enough. We need, to, we need ways to filter this information, integrate this information into, into to make it more palatable for decision makers. And decision makers are a very strange species, right? They don't understand Python, they don't like R, they have probably never heard about um, taxonomy. They have, uh, they, they, they are not biodiversity scientists. They are not environmental scientists. And our task is try to translate what we do in the language of policymakers. And sometimes this language is dollars or euros for this region. So we need something that can help us optimize the diverse set of information that um, comes from biodiversity. And biodiversity, it's a complex, complex uh, uh, thing to describe because it has multiple dimensions. You're probably familiar with the species level, but below species level, you have genetic information. And there is now technologies like eDNA that are starting to collect this information and make this information available very cheaply. Right, and this is not going to stop. This is actually going to continue into the future. And above the species level, you have ecosystems, populations, and we also need to create a system that can help us address the change and measure the change at these levels. The other um, characteristics of this are that this needs to work at multiple spatial and temporal scales. This needs to be sensitive to change. Right, we need to. We need to measure things that um, <laughs> can tell us a little bit about the pulse of the planet and how this is changing, the pulse of the biodiversity planet. So we didn't invent this, right? We just copy the framework. And the community that actually started all this process of the essential variables is the climate community. And I want to um, show this picture because this is a very cool one where you have on the left um, at the top, you have the way people used to collect information for the essential climate variables. It was the, the very basics, the very beginning of this uh, global network. And even today, we're using similar approaches to measure the same information. And what this um, 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 a harmony in the collection methods has produced is a network that is global, obviously with some places more represented than others, but we have precipitation and temperature weather stations collecting information around the world and around the clock that are making possible for you and me to wake up every morning, look at my phone and have a prediction of what is going to be the weather that day. So I can prepare for that. I need to put raincoats on my kids. Do I need to take my car because it's going to be super cold? This is the power of, of data, right? And we are trying to do something similar for biodiversity. How? So first we need to start with the very beginning. We're trying to mobilize primary observations from all the monitoring programs. And this is a very challenging job because we're, we're, we have a lot of biodiversity scientists and maybe a lot of scientists in other areas have big egos. So my job is try to connect with these people and try to get them to share the data. Once we do this first step, we start to harmonize and integrate the information. And sometimes this needs, needs a little bit of modeling to fill information gaps because information obviously is not, um, doesn't exist for all the variables um, across space or even across time. And then the, the, the fourth step in this process is we want to distribute this information. We want to make sure that this is reachable, that this is this is findable. We're fully abiding by the fair principles here, and um, we want to make sure that this is this is um, helping the community. We we have been slowly making our way into this process, and we have produced um, some some scientific articles um, that um, portray the workflows that need to happen for each of these types of data. These are just three examples, but there are more in the workings. 
but it's important to understand that these um, scientific um, developments are, are important, but they are not the only thing because very few policymakers, very few decision makers have access to this scientific literature in places like my country, where I come from, South America, Bolivia. We have um, defined trying to come up with a common understanding of all these dimensions. We have um, work our way around this biological entity at the core of the system. And the data cube that we're building is around this um, uh, entity, which could be a species, if you're thinking about the species level, could be also an ecosystem, you're thinking about an ecosystem level um, um, in the biodiversity concept. And this is more or less the biodiversity data cube, the EBB data cube that we're um, considering has the core, as I mentioned, the biological entities. It can accommodate different scenarios. For example, if you're projecting the distribution of species and the different climate scenarios, you could actually accommodate this as a different dimension in the cube. You could have different metrics if you're thinking about what was um, presented before by, by our colleague. Um, phenology, it can accommodate the different metrics that, um, that phenology has. And then this is a learning by uh, doing by learning, learning by doing, <laughs> as Americans like to say, we're improving as we continue to bring more data sets into the portal. And um, these are some of the, the uh, metadata fields that we thought are important in this process of integrating biodiverse information. And we're not reinventing the wheel, we're just taking um, terms from the ACDD convention, which is dedicated to create um, metadata standards for net CDF files, which is the file um, structure that we decided to use. But we have also thought that this is not enough. So we have um, um, created a couple additional terms that help us describe the highly dimensionality within biodiversity, which is EBB class name entities and scenario. This is still evolving, as I mentioned, and we're um, um, adequating the, the, the standard as we, as we uh, evolve. So this is the EBB data portal, and I will quickly jump now into the, into the, into the portal um, so you could see what I'm talking about. So um, if you go to the if you go to the EBB data portal, um, and I will quickly copy the link into the chat, you will get to this page. We have um, we would like people that is using this uh, data portal to register, right? If you want to upload data. You, you, you must register. There is no way around that because we want to know who, who's uploading the data. But if you want to use the data, you don't need to register. You can just go to this website without registration and just download the data. So you have four different uh, uh, tabs here. You have home that tells you a little bit about the general stuff on the website, what kind of data sets we have and what kind of EBB class they belong. And you can see a lot of modeling data that has been recently uploaded here. But you also have a tab that allows you to discover. And then you could select different attributes. And then this will basically help you filter these different data sets. One important thing is that you can quickly download the data in NetCDF format which has already the metadata embedded as part of the, the file. But if you are interested just in the metadata, you could actually download these in two different versions, flavors. One is the ACCD JSON format and the other one is EML, XML um, uh, format. But okay, this is a bit too sciencey, right? We have um, another one, another tab here that is um, the visual. The, the visualizing tool we call the VAT system because we're getting support from a small team of developers that are helping us in this complex task of um, mapping and visualizing highly dimensional data. And unfortunately, the, <laughs> the, 
it's broken. It was working an hour ago, but it's now broken. So I, I cannot show you what um, uh, here, I, you could be seeing all the different maps that we have. But, um, but I want to go back here and I want to quickly show you the last of the tabs, which is the upload one. So the upload one, it's um, basically a form where you will have to type down all the attributes, very simple uh, attributes for your data. And I will just quickly go to my dashboard. It's where I have my data sets and I've been working to upload um, a few data sets. And I'll show you quickly um, an in progress data set so you could see what I'm talking about. This is the global reptile assessment. This is a paper I recently published in, um, um, with some colleagues. And we have around uh, 10,000 species maps uh, for uh, reptile species. And th these are gridded maps. And this is perfect example, right? This is perfect example because if you have them on, on your computer, this will be 10,000 raster maps. Imagine that you have one folder and you have 10,000 things there. It's really difficult to navigate, really difficult to find something, right? So here, what we have done is actually bring together this data set into the portal. We have filled a little name, right? The global reptile assessment, the date, um, a little summary that describes what this data set is actually about. You can put, if there is any DOI, connected with this, you can include that. Obviously, we also are working to provide a DOI if someone that has its own data wants to publish this data on the EBB portal, they will get a DOI. So by doing this, the EBB data portal team and ID is making a commitment to store your data for at least 10 years, right? This is our commitment. Your commitment as a data publisher is that you want to serve this data for free, right? This is you're giving this data for the community so they can use and reuse. So we have a few other metadata uh, 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 the descriptors here, the methods. Um, in a way, we don't want you to repeat the methods if you have a paper, but people just copy paste from the methods or they just create a synthetic version of the methods. If there is any project associated to this data set, you could put the information here. Um, and then the creator name. This is a drop down menu, and this is a database that is collected to the Global Biodiversity Observation Network database of GeoBond. So, to, to be able to, to, to be part of this drop down menu, you have to register to the GeoBond, which is the, this um, uh, organization that was hosted by IB for two consecutive periods and now it's based in Canada. But if your name is not here, you can also um, just select this option and then you will be able to include your name, your institution, if there is any co-creators, and then the license, right? Ideally, we would love to have licenses that are uh, <laughs> CC by four, right? That allow this to be reused and, and, and abused, if you, if you will. But um, we also understand that there is some people that, um, have different approaches to this. For example, IUCN, uh, and I'm working with a couple data sets from IUCN as well. They have terms of reference. They don't abide by CC license type. They use terms of reference and they clearly state what are the, um, how should you cite your, the information, how um, what uses are allowed, what uses are not. And then once you fill this information that is really, you know, the basics of, you go to this one where you have the EBB attributes. And we've been slowly fixing this because we understand that this is a, can be a little bit challenging for people that are not familiar with essential biodiversity variables. For example, we have created these um, categories that are representing the classes. And if you click one of these, then it will automatically open categories under this. So for example, species population is one EBB class and under EBB class species population, you have two types of EBBs, which is a species distribution and a species abundances, right? 
Um, there is one that I really like, which is ecosystem disturbance. And there is a little bit of a debate going on um, now within the group um, about what we should consider disturbance, right? We're just talking about fires, for example, or lights from uh, lights at night, these uh, remotely sensed derived uh, liars that are made available from MODI, Sentinel, other sensors that could be also be very interesting to, 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 to put here. But we are being limited by one of the terms in the definition. Needs, these variables need to be biotic. So we're still um, you know, trying to think carefully how do we expand or not this concept. And then finally, you will get to the metric and the scenario. And this is perhaps the most complicated part because not everybody thinks the way we are thinking when you create a data set, right? What is this? Is this, is this a yes, no map? Is this a, a continuous prediction with probability of occurrence? What is this exactly? If you think about, for example, um, um, NDVI that is you know, derived from remote sensing, this is normally values that range from one value to another and then the higher means that you have more green there, right? So how do you capture this information? We will help you. Just contact us if you have, if you're struggling, trying to upload your data here, we will we'll make sure that we will work with you because we don't have that many data sets. We are a few people here in the, in the lab that I work and we will be able to, to tailor um, this to your requirements and work with you. And then special domain, standard stuff, no, not too much to explain there. If the data has any, you know, uh, revisit time, um, the extent, environmental domain, terrestrial, marine, freshwater, and any comments. And then you are moved to the last page where you basically um, either upload your data or um, upload this as a draft. And then some people have data sets that are humongous, right? More than 500. Um, gigabytes in size or even terabytes. And then what we have, we, we, we will work with you on, on ways on how to move the data. But um, as you can see, we're facing challenges one, one at a time. We're like um, learning by doing. And then, um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is what we've been working. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, uh, for presenting this uh, great work <clears throat> on the uh, just a second uh, on the on the Geopond portal. Um, I think we we continue uh, with the with the presentation. So we now uh, hit uh, the three pillars, uh, having the, the the times and times SDR uh, focusing on long term ob uh, observation uh, facilities uh, in the data. Uh, having VLAP uh, using or generating Earth observation products uh, and uh, sharing the workflows, uh, generating results which are of relevance for the for the different sites uh, and the, the Geopon portal uh, really gives um, uh, information on a global scale, but also on the on the European scale, relevant also for the for the single sites. Uh, and we come now to the to the last part, uh, which is trying to bring this together and to, to make something uh, which is of added value for the for the single sites. Uh, and with this, I, I hand over to Vladan Minich from Biosense Institute, uh, dealing uh, with the Ecosense, Ecosense uh, service, trying to bring together uh, these different bits and pieces. Vladan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Femis. We feel everybody from my side as well. Just a second, I will share whole my screen. And this is the web portal that we are making in this project. It's called the Ecosense. The address is still not official, uh, eShape uh, URL. So it's, it's still under development. Uh, so just to minimize this. I don't know if you see that. So uh, the, the idea is, as Johannes mentioned, is to have uh, one stop shop here and to, to try to see, to, to visualize all the data available 
uh, in, in this project. And uh, here you can see the sites that uh, Christoph already mentioned. Uh, so every uh, site in Dames, which is under Elter network, Elter Europe network, which you can see here, is actually harvested and stored uh, in our platform. So this is the only thing that we are storing here. Uh, data, every data that you will, that I will show you very soon, are actually on remote servers. So we are not storing the, the data. Uh, we are not replicating the data in in this portal. So at the beginning, uh, of course, you you have a site. Uh, these reds are sites. So pins are all only dots described in names as as a point. Or if they are described as a polygon, you can see the polygon as well. Uh, you can search the sites by title, or you, you can type here, for example, and you, you will get the, the name or by, by uh, countries and so on. And then you will be zoomed to, to the sites that you, you're interested in. Uh, I will show you, for example, the one site in, in Serbia and Colin, colleagues of, of mine are here uh, watching this presentation as well. So this is an example when uh, this is selection tool. So if this tick box is, is selected and when you click on the site, you will get the all available metadata uh, which are stored in Dames platform. So you can see uh, the details here, everything which is the URL can, can be clicked. Uh, then there are other data as well. And there are a lot of data actually. And at the beginning, because we, we didn't have any kind of data, we decided to, to, to try with some uh, data comparison because we already have our national platform, AgroSense, that we are developing also in Serbia, which is free for use uh, for our farmers. And then we, we decided to, to try to connect uh, this data that we have there also with this EcoSense platform. Unfortunately, this is only for Serbia. But th th that was the first idea that we started from. So I can pick up the different dates, and then you, you will see the data from uh, Sentinel-2 images. Uh, of course, they are both green now in this period, and we can also compare the NDVI that we are pr producing by uh, processing those images. Uh, by zooming on one side of, of the map, you can compare the other one as well. So you, you can see that they're actually uh, more red in this part and more green in this here. And so th this is the reason, th this is the way how, how you can com compare the, the data. There, there is of course a legend describing what is this index, uh, what, what is this index used use, use for. Uh, you also um, uh, saw at the beginning, just a second to unzoom and my internet is a bit slow. Uh, these blue dots, blue pins actually, uh, these pins are actually stations that have uh, the in, in, in situ measurements uh, time series data. So if I click any of them, I will get a list. Now the, 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 uh, you, you saw this scroller, then that, that means that uh, the, the data are uh, getting in, in, in the moment when I click on, on, on the link. So those, those uh, available measurements are uh, offered here. And for example, I'm interested in, in albedo sky and uh, this uh, right temperature. I can also click uh, select all time series, for example. And then when I click also uh, again, okay, then I'm fetching the data at, at that moment from, from the remote server. And you can see the data here. Uh, you can see different things here. For example, the first uh, measurement and last measurement for, for this, uh, you can click on these three dots and you can expor export this graph as an image in different formats. You can export it in different uh, file formats like JSON, uh, CSV and so on. So you can play uh, in, in your own uh, R or Python or what, whatever you, you are using for. You can, you can change the dates, for example, from 1st March, until 31, for example, and then click show again, and then it will fetch again new set of new set of data. Uh, I can return to map, and maybe I'm interested in to just a second, not to them, but this one. Sorry, uh, I may be interested in in another station, which offers the, the same kind of data. So if I zoom out. 
and choose another one. And again, the, the, the available uh, measurements are shown here. I can pick the one I'm interested in. And then I will get, again, more data for both of them. Just a second. And I can see here that they are data, for example, but they are not in the, in the same, from the same period. So that, that, that is actually the reason why we made this visualization tool, because there are data, but maybe the, the data that they are there uh, are not uh, suitable for, for your research, as you can see here. And now you, by using this software, you, you can maybe spot some outliers or it's, you can see that the, the data is missing and, and so on. And that is the reason why, why we choose to, to make a platform like this. So uh, especially with this uh, spatial data, uh, which are very huge, then if you download far, a few gigabytes of data and then you realize that the data are not suitable for you, then it's a waste of time and bandwidth and, and so on. Um, okay, I can go back and continue. And then we decided to, to uh, implement some other uh, other layers that, that are available uh, and then we decided to uh, to implement this uh, digital elevation model uh, from uh, copernicus so this is uh, this data is, uh, are also not on our server it's it's they are on ESA servers and what we made is a tool for example if you choose one spot here and click on it then you will get the height of that pixel that, that you click in so for example, if I'm clicking here, then it's 558 meters and, and you, you can see that how, how it changes. Of course, the, the legend is here. So the, it's usual that greens are lower parts and brown are higher one. Okay, I will then turn those two off. And also we implemented Korean land cover. At the, this is this was very tricky because at this zoom level it is a raster file, but when you zoom in enough, then they they switch their uh, presentation with, with vector, so it's a bit different. And and again, just a second to okay. And if I click on one spot, then I will get the the uh, land coverage for for that particular pixel, and you can hear scroll to see what is available uh, uh, as a class for this land covered in, in Korean. And then finally, uh, the data start to, to, to come. Uh, for example, uh, colleagues from my sites made this snow cover uh, in, in for, do, for those years uh, for the sites mentioned here. And I will pick just a moment. I zoom out too much. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in, in this uh, Kirkini Lake and I will turn on the Kirkini Lake, and then you will you will get this uh, play tool here. So uh, ev every date is presented here in one in, in, in those those years. So I can okay, I can click on play, and it will be changed automatically on every on every few seconds. Uh, here is uh, legend. So when there is no data, it it is white or it, it is cloud. Cloudy. If there is snow, like in this January, you can see the blue parts, or you can stop it. You can jump manually, you know, forward, backward, or you can click on on the date you are interested in, and and get data. Uh, as as I said, it is very important to see the data, and uh, does this data fit to to your needs in your in your research. And that's the reason why, why we made it in first to visualize the data and then user can decide to download the huge amount of data and then to, to play with, with that product. Uh, the 
most recent data that we got are also this Kerkini Lake that, uh, just a second to turn off this one, that um, Maria also, also, also sh shown in, in, in her, sorry, I didn't turn it off. So you, you can see the data for, for, for Kirkini Lake. These are uh, these data. So so actually, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, is it better to show this the, these years listed here as one layer because th this one one layer is represent whole year. So we will have uh, here a player with the years instead of dates. So when, when, instead of clicking and turning on and off those layers then you will have a play tool here and click play and get one and you it, it, it layer will be called just Kirkini in, instead of uh, the, the, this enumeration like, like this here. That, that, that is my question. But uh, what is uh, what is good for, for example, that you can see that this lake every year is, uh, is getting lower and lower. Actually that this area here are getting uh, without water for those periods and Suddenly, in the last year, you can see that it, the, this water re returning back, so that, that there were more water in, in this than in previous years. And last, but not least, actually not last, but almost the last, are this EBV uh, data. Uh, Miguel explained that how big these data are, that, that they could be a few gigabytes. And it's very hard to pick exact uh, species in those data cubes. Uh, so we are working with them on the, this API in order to select some species and to get the, 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 the availability of, of that data for spe specified region. But for example, you can see here only the metadata. Sorry, there are no data for this one. Maybe I can choose another. Global. Okay, let's try with this one. No. Yes, you, you mentioned that that's the, the this is not working, uh, Miguel. Uh, this portal. Yes, currently something is going on with the bats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 there's a reason. Yeah. There's a reason why I'm getting uh, no, 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 no data. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, so, so you you will get the list. You will get the the list of, of available data. Actually, you will get the list of metadata. Uh, everything is described there, and at the end there is also a link to this net CDF file. So if you are interested in, then you can just copy the link and, and download lo download it. And this will be the, the last thing that I wanted to say is actually that you can change also some base map, so it will be easily spotted some difference if you if you show some layers uh, on on top of this uh, platform. So this is uh, still uh, uh, work in progress, and we are expecting some uh, some uh, uh, feedback from from you. Is this useful? Uh, what would you like to see here, and how you would like to see here, and 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 etc. Because we are making this for you, and not not just to make some platform. And th that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Vladan and uh, and colleagues uh, <clears throat> presenting the, uh, the 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 material and the and the work done. Uh, as Vladan uh, already mentioned, uh, it's it's about work in progress. Uh, so that is uh, really the the things going on. Uh, work done now in the in the E-shape context uh, is a starting point uh, for uh, what we are doing, and uh, this will hopefully continue uh, in the near uh, future. Um, we are now entering the, the, the question and uh, answer session, um, which we, uh, which gives you the, the opportunity uh, to, uh, to have, uh, to ask any question uh, you want to have. Uh, and one important one, um, Vladan already mentioned, uh, is uh, are these tools uh, useful for you and how this uh, could be provided uh, in future? And I would ask uh, the presenters to turn on uh, the video uh, to answer the uh, the questions. Uh, there is one question from uh, Ricardo uh, dealing uh, with the calculation of the hydro period uh, and how uh, that is done. And this is a, a question I would hand over uh, to Maria. 
uh, and um, and also uh, Ulf started uh, to answer it in the uh, in the chat. Uh, to answer this uh, question. Hannes, can I just uh, jump in for a second? Um, yes. The better person to ask is Janis himself because he did it and uh, he also answered in the chat already um, and said how he did it uh, and pop, uh, put also a link to a publication. So this question I think is asked. If there's more question, maybe Ricardo, you can uh, contact uh, Janis directly. And Chris was right, there were some questions also on dimes, but uh, they have also been asked before, so answer before. Not all of them. Not okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, then I would uh, uh, first uh, I give the, the, the hand or the, the, the floor to Johannes. Um, I haven't uh, seen that he's uh, joining. Uh, so, Johannes, yes. The floor is yours. May I? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So sorry for my screen, I have problems with the internet. Uh, the issue is we have uh, done some work previously in the uh, Copotensial project, which we have adapted for Kerkini Lake and the needs of this aid. So we have used uh, Sentinel-2 with these two publications. And uh, if we don't have uh, enough data from Sentinel-2, we use also the fusion with Sentinel-1 to generate the inundation maps. Then depending on the, we have X inundation maps for a specific given uh, period in time, let's say from 1st of uh, September till 31st of August, from one year to the other year. And uh, in between, we calculate the distances in time. And uh, uh, we say that if a pixel in instance one is inundated and in instance two is again inundated, therefore the whole duration of the instances, this is all the days that are included, it is, they are considered to be inundated. So if in one instance it is inundated and the other is not, then we divide this period of time. So if it is 10 days, then five days we consider that the pixel is inundated and five pixel is not inundated. So this is the procedure to derive the hydro period uh, 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 as you have seen on screen. Okay, does that answer the, the, the questions, Ricardo? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, I know the, the procedures because I we work together in the potential with uh, Ioannis. Uh, the point was, rather than uh, knowing exactly the, the procedure, which I know uh, by heart, I would say, uh, the point is to maybe, and it's also extensible to the other layers, it's worth maybe, Vladan, to indicate in the layers uh, a link to to document where it comes from. Uh, even if it's the Corine, we all know the Corine, but uh, it would be worth to to have a kind of link in the layers, not not I mean in the legend that can allow you to understand what is behind the layer we are uh, you are providing. Uh, that would be really helpful because you always yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we, we were thinking about that as well, but we need to wait a bit more because I, I don't know which which data will be publicly open and which not. So if we made something now and start to share some links and then we will be in problems. So we, we need to, to know which data we need, to, let's say, to hide sources and which data we can show freely with, with links, direct links to, to the source and, and to, to metadata and etc. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thanks, Vladan. Uh, there were questions about uh, times, uh, and I would to ask um, Christoph uh, to answer them. Yes, I'm just going to share my screen again. So I hope you can see the quality assurance tool. Um, there were a few questions. The first one was really simple. Um, don't type in HTTP colon slash slash QA. It's not necessary, just type in qa.dimes.org and it will take you to the proper address. There's like the technical details behind that is HTTPS, that's like the secure version. If you take the S away, it's not the secure version. It's it's a web thing. If you just type in qa.dimes.org, it's fine. Um, if you are at this tool, you can just type in any site name, uh, and it will give you the report. So it's pretty public. Um, and what we had is not for this site record, but some site manager just contacted me and said, well, this it says here, there's unverified network RI affiliation. What does that mean? 
if you go to the record itself, there is this little part here, and this part tells you um, to which networks the site belongs. This site belongs to ILTA, and it has like a little green check mark. So this is a verified ILTA member, this is a verified ILTA Europe member, this is a verified ILTA Austria member, and then it has a network um, called EMAP, and this is not verified. Okay, and if you if you hover with your cursor, it will tell you what that means. So it means the European Monitoring and Evaluation Program hasn't verified that this site actually reports to this network or program or is part of it. That's it's a political thing. So we don't do accreditation for every alter for every network there is. We do it for the alter networks and we do it for very few selected non alter networks. But we don't do it for every network on the planet. That's why we have this little info box that says it's not verified by the network on dimes. So this means it might very well be a member, but we can't say it is because we have no agreement with that network to do that. Okay, so that's a very political thing. Um, then we had more questions. So I got a few questions bilaterally, so I'm answering more questions now. Um, there are not just Alta sites and dimes. So you can see that nicely on the map and you can switch between layers. So this is the green points here. They show every single site there is on dimes and you have a layer option here. And if you click on this one, those are the Alta sites that are on dimes. A little irritating because some of them are not in Europe, but in principle, those are the sites that are in Alta. And as you can see, there's a huge discrepancy because we have non Alta sites as well. And depending on, on which layer you choose, you get more sites, or less sites. So the non Alta sites on dimes as well. The majority of sites on dimes are Alta, but not every single one of them. Um, and then we had another question. Uh, and that is, uh, what data do we have on dimes? It's a little difficult to answer. Uh, it really depends on the site as well. So if you, again, you type in any, any site, you search for it, you go to the record. Uh, on dimes, primarily, we show the data that we have about that site. And we link in external data, but it's, it's no universal thing. We don't, we don't store all the data that, that the site has. So we only have very few selected data sets. So this is a site that has added a lot of data sets for dimes, but that's not always the case. It's, it's up to the, the, up to the set, site managers if they want to share that information, if, you, if they want to put that in there. In the future, we're going to move a lot of that functionality to a new system. And then on dimes, we're just going to link that information. So we're not going to physically store that information, any, that data anymore. We're just going to add the link to another system and we'll store all the data sets. And then we just present the link and say, in the other system, there are, I don't know, 100 data sets. And we just, we have some dynamic linking and it, you can see the list and you can maybe download it through Dimes, but it will just be a link. It won't be actually on Dimes. Okay. Any more questions in the meantime? Um, um. Yes, yes. There's another one with the HTTP, like I said. <laughs> Uh, don't like to repeat myself, but don't type in HTTP. Okay, maybe your browser doesn't support that. Okay, but you should actually never, when you serve, type in HTTP. It's always the S. And like I said, when it's like when it's Chrome, for instance, like the one I'm using right now, you don't need to type that in. It will do that automatically. Just type in dimes.org. It will take you to the right thing. Okay. Maybe if you use a link in a document. And the person that wrote the document accidentally used this one, then it will take you to this page. Okay, but like I said, you should you shouldn't use HTTP. You should always use HTTPS, and you don't need to type that in. The browser will do that automatically. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Christoph. Uh, and it's in, important to uh, to mention here uh, that the that the work uh, we are doing and. Uh, part uh, one of the of the core services for example also of the uh, future LTRI uh, will be uh, the dimes str and this uh, Christoph just just mentioned uh, that will also 
uh, include an extension of the of the capability of the L2 information system where DIMES uh, and uh, Ecosense as a, as a visualization platform uh, will play an important role. Uh, so these are things which are, are supported and also developed uh, by the funding uh, of eShape, uh, but are powered uh, by, the, by the ELTA network and the ELTA research infrastructure, which is now uh, going to be uh, built or is, is, uh, is now being built uh, in, the, uh, in the near future. Sorry, Hannes, Andy asked uh, how I pick it up this, yes. uh, just a second to unzoom yes. and to turn on stations. So uh, you need to, to turn on stations to, to get up, sorry, to get the, the blue, blue pins, but also uh, this needs to be selected. So you can see this um, uh, sign here. So if it's site, then if you click on it, it will be a site data. But if you click on station and click on blue one, then you will get the station data. And then you, you will get the, the list of available measurements. And for example, if I'm interested in this water volume data, of course, uh, this, these are the data previously selected. So I can remove some of them if I'm not interested in them or, or so on, or I can clear all of them because now I need to, to wait for all of them to, to, to fetch the, the data from the remote server. Some of them are already here. This is just one measurement, for example, but that's how the data look, look like. And here still lo loads, the, loads the data. And as I said, you, you can turn them off and you can clear everything. And uh, this is also still uh, in process of harmonization because some uh, SOS, this is, uh, those, uh, those, time, uh, those in situ data are uh, stored in uh, SOS server, this sensor observation server. And uh, majority of uh, those servers are using this proxy made by 52 degrees north. So you can have this uh, start and beginning date and uh, to, to get the data much easier. But there are some links, uh, actually some uh, sources that are not uh, using this 52 degrees north. So I know that there is a problem, for example, I think in Germany, in this, I think that this, oh, sorry, the station is not selected. Yes, so, so the, 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 there, there is no list of the data. There is a pin, but there, there are no the data. So we need to, to uh, sure. do, do work, to, to, do, to do more work in order to include yeah. this data as well. Okay. Thanks, uh, Vladan. Um, Ulf, uh, you are monitoring the, uh, the chat box. Um, is there any, any open question from the, from the chat box? No, there's no that I got. Are there any open questions uh, now to the to the audience uh, you want to raise now? Uh, so you also can uh, well now in this uh, discussion question and answer uh, phase. Uh, so it's uh, you can also ask uh, questions um, directly uh, using the raised hand um, if you want to have uh, any further uh, information on the on the tools and services uh, provided. Um, through ELTA and uh, supported by, uh, by eShape. If there are no further questions uh, on, the, uh, on the different services, uh, I would like to thank you for participating uh, in the webinar. Uh, and um, asking questions, uh, giving your uh, patience and attendance to the, to the work uh, we were doing. Uh, as we have said, um, as it was uh, said before, uh, so it's still some of the things are work in progress. Uh, eShape uh, has uh, still uh, another one year to go uh, until, or nearly one year to go until finalization uh, of, the, of the project. So hopefully also together with your feedback, and this important linkage uh, with the with the El with ELTA and the ELTA research infrastructure, the definition of the of the service portfolio uh, in the in the core services, uh, I think we will be able to to further tailor uh, and uh, develop the, the the services so they are uh, for added value uh, for you. Uh, 
Uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, all the presenters uh, for providing uh, information on the different tools. Uh, I would uh, like to thank you uh, as participants uh, in the, uh, to, the, to the webinar uh, for your uh, attendance uh, and also the, the, the questions uh, you raised. Uh, and um, I would, uh, yeah, I would say have a nice afternoon uh, if you have any questions uh, on the tools. So please contact us, um, the, uh, which the, the information uh, should be provided uh, for, the, for the different tools. Uh, and we are, uh, we are happily answering uh, your questions and uh, getting in touch uh, with you. Uh, with this, yeah, thanks and have a nice uh, afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Johannes and all.